That's better. That helps. Thank you. All right, what's happening in Deuteronomy chapter 4 is simply this. Moses is calling the adult generation of Israelites, that new generation of Israelites, I should say, to a place of obedience in anticipation and preparation for entering the promised land. I happened to be reading Deuteronomy chapter 4 the other day, and when I was reading it, I was reminded of a recent uh, conversation that I had about two aspects of the person of God that are both included in this chapter. And so I want to highlight them. The first one is in verse 39 of Deuteronomy 4, and here's what we read. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, here it is, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there's none else. What the, that uh, verse tells us is that God is far above us. And we're not talking about merely distance and space. But what he means by that is that God is so big, heaven and earth can't contain him. He transcends heaven and earth. He's far above everything and everyone. But now look at verse 7 in this same chapter. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is, and all things that we call upon him for. So in verse 39, God's far above. In verse 7, God's very near. He's close. I don't want to wow you, but there are two theological terms for those two characteristics or attributes of God. Are you ready? The first one is that God is transcendent, that God is transcendent. And what that means is that he is far above all of his creation. He transcends his creation. He's far above it. God is outside of humanity's full experience. He's way past that. And then the second theological term, not only that God is transcendent, but that God is, are you ready? Immanent. Immanent. Let me spell it. I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T. Immanent. What does that mean? That simply means God's close. He's far above, far beyond, transcends. He's also imminent. He's close. He, uh, humans can experientially know God. He's that close. Human beings can have some sense of understanding God. And because God is imminent, because God is close, he's very near He's aware of what's going on. And God has a compassion for suffering that he sees in among the human race. And he has compassion even for sinners. Thankful for that. And here's the best part. Because of that, because he's not only immanent, very close, but he is transcendent, he's above all this, he has the power to heal. He has the power to rescue. He has the power to redeem us. So you see, both of those characteristics of God are very important. Aren't you glad he has both of them? God's a transcendent God. God is a immanent God. He is far above all. He is very close to us. So those are the two things that I want to share with you from Deuteronomy chapter 4 tonight. Before we do, let's pause again in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's good for us once again to open your word. We thank you for it. It is a light that we must give heed to. 
especially in the darkness that we're in the midst of in our world. We take heed now to the light of your word, and we see that Jesus himself is that light. And Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to sense your presence. We want to know, Lord, what you want us to know tonight from this scripture. We just pray that as a result of being together here tonight, that we'd know that we'd had a meeting with you. Make yourself real to us. Make the changes in us that need to be made. And do it all for your glory, for your name's sake, we pray. Amen. So let's talk about God being transcendent. God being far above. God being exalted infinitely, far above his creatures, so that human minds are incapable of fully grasping God. You know, the Bible says that in all things, Jesus Christ might have the preeminence. But when we talk about God being transcendent, it's not just that he's preeminent. He is transcendent. That is, that God stands eternally apart from humanity. That if he wasn't also immanent, if he wasn't also nigh us, as verse 7 says, he would be totally unapproachable. We'd never be able to come near him. As creator God, he is exalted infinitely higher than even the archangels. He is so awesome, our God, and really so frightening that whenever he appears to human beings, you see it in the scripture, they intensely feel their personal insufficiency and their sinfulness, and they're overwhelmed with a, with a, a, a feeling of terror and panic. Think of it, Abram. Remember what he did? When he met God, he fell on his face and Genesis chapter 15, and was put into a deep sleep. And then Moses, when he met God at that burning bush, he covered his face for the brightness of the presence of God. Remember Isaiah, when God called him and commissioned him, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and he said, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. Remember Daniel. Daniel is really significant. In Daniel chapter 10, when the Lord appears to Daniel in a vision, he says, I was left alone, and there remained no strength in me, and my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength, and I was in a deep sleep on my face, on my face toward the ground. Remember John in the Revelation? He falls on his face before the risen, exalted Christ who appears to him in a vision in that first chapter, and the Lord puts his hand upon him and tells him, fear not, and picks him up. Whenever human beings really meet this God like this, they're frightened to death. And they, their, their fight ends, and they surrender to him. Remember Saul of Tarsus? Lord, what would thou have me to do when he sees the bright Shekinah glory of the Lord Jesus on that road to Damascus? It's a crude illustration, but let's say there's a family that has a, a little toddler, and they're hiking on a beautiful day. On a, on a mountain, and as they take in all of the beauty of around them in their mountain hike, all of a sudden, to, the, to their horror, the parents realize that their little toddler has disappeared, and they start to look and search frantically, and they can't find him anywhere. They end up getting in touch with the authorities, the park rangers, they put out an, uh, a search. There's helicopters flying. There are people on search and rescue teams looking for this little toddler. All of a sudden, 
all of the beauty and majesty of that mountain is nothing because now the focal point is not the mountain, but now the focal point is that little lost toddler. When a person meets this God that is far above all, this God that is transcendent, all the focus is on him and no one and nothing else. But here's the second part, as I had you look in verse 7, and also note verse 12. In verse 7, Moses says, What nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Down to verse 12. And the Lord spake unto you out of the, really, the heart of the fire. He spake unto you out of the heart of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but you saw no similitude. Only you heard a voice. God speaking. God meeting with people. God showing up, you might say. God not far above, but here, very near. Because God's at the same time, he is far above and he's close. He's imminent. God's a personal God. God's a God that is personally knowable. God himself, I believe, places in the human heart a desire to know him. Do you have that desire? You say, I'm saved. Yeah, but do you still have that desire to know him more? It's God that places that desire in the human heart initially and continually and he's the one that makes it possible for you to, to personally experience an encounter with him. Have you had one of them recently? Have you ever, can you point to a time where you have had a personal encounter with God? He's very near like that. So different from the false gods of false religions. The false gods of false religions are distant from their adherents. They're untouchable by their creatures. And they are not distinguishable from because they are all a part of creation. For instance, Hinduism. Everything's God. All of creation is God in Hinduism. There's no distinction between the creator and the creature. Here's the point. God's not only far above. God is very close. And the title of my message is The Far Above Close God. He's very close. In fact, if any human being will take the tiniest step toward knowing God, that really pleases him. That pleases the Lord because he's a far above close God. And he wants that closeness with us. And when you realize these two things about him, that he is transcendent, he's far above all, but yet he is imminent, he is very close, he's near all, then you recognize several things that I want to quickly close with. Number one, there is no hiding from God. You can't hide from him. And you know, quite frankly, I don't want to hide from him. I know perhaps there were times when I did. But right now, I don't want to hide from God. And listen how the psalmist puts it so beautifully. In 139th, oh Lord, thou hast searched me. And the word search there is you've searched me in detail. It's like you've ransacked my life. You've gone through every little cubby hole. You have totally searched me. And he says, you know me. You know so much about me. You know my down sittings and my uprising. <clears throat> you understand my thought from afar. You compass my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue. And you know it all together already. You beset me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. He says, the thought of that is just so wonderful. I can't contain it. I can't comprehend it. God sees and he knows all about you. Because God's not merely a distant entity or spiritual force. He's your loving Abba. He is 
intimately acquainted, as the psalmist says, with you and everything that pertains to you, all the details, your entire direction of your life, your thoughts that are forming. God never wants to be far away from you. He's like a devoted papa. He never lets you out of his sight. He's with you all the time and in all of your circumstances. Listen to verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Whether shall I flee from your presence? The answer is rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. There's no hiding from God. There's a second thing that these truths about his character tell us. There is no life apart from God. There's no such thing as a life apart from God. People fool themselves into thinking that they're living apart from God, but they're not. It's in him that we live and move and have our being. It's how Paul says it here in the uh, 17th chapter of the book of Acts, that wonderful sermon there on uh, Morris Hill. He says, God has set it up that mankind seek the Lord. Uh, he's not far from any of us. He's imminent. He's not far from any of us. For in him we live, we move, we have our being. He's, and he, and he uh, goes on to say, listen to this. He hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he's determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they might happily seek God. There's no life apart from God. The Greek gods that uh, the people in Athens worshipped, those Greek gods were remote, and it required their, uh, their followers to make dangerous trips up to Mount Olympus, a dangerous journey, and to get there, to find their gods, and then to do something to placate their god. But though God is transcendent, he's very far above us. He's also, he's not removed from us. He's not unknowable to us. He's determined, Paul says, the nations of the earth's place time in history and their geographical boundaries that these nations of people might find him and he stimulates their search by faith he says without faith it's impossible to please him they that come to god must believe that he is he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him he promises through the prophet Jeremiah to the people of Judah, if you will seek for me with all of your heart, I'll be found of you. There's no life apart from God. And God urges people to seek him because he wants to rescue them. He wants to redeem them. And so he says to Israel, why will you die? And he says to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near and he'll have mercy upon you, and he will abundantly pardon you. There's no hiding from God, not this God. There is no life apart from God. And thirdly, there is no hope without God. One of the characteristics of the nations that did not have the God of Israel in Ephesians 2.12, he said, before you met the God of Israel, the Gentile nations of this earth, they were without hope because they were without God in this world. There's no hope without God. And in our hopeless world, in our hopeless situations, we find purpose, we find peace, because our present as well as our future is as bright as the promises of God. Our present is that we have new life. And our future, and by the way, in that new life, there's all the provision, everything that we need for life and godliness is provided. And then the future is sewed up too by God. We have this confidence that, that uh, we're going to see our loved ones that have gone to be with the Lord. We're going to see them again one day. What wonderful hope that is. We're going to get a new body one day as believers. We're going to have a new home, a permanent home called heaven, called the New Jerusalem. 
God is going to put us back on this earth, and it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And so Paul says, you can't compare your temporal sufferings with the unimaginable glory that is yet to be revealed, is what he tells us. Look, we have all the hope forever. So there's no hiding from God. There's no life apart from God. There's no hope without God. And one more thing, and this doesn't even end it, but this is all I'm going to share. There's no joy except in God. The psalmist says in Psalm 16 and verse 11 that in God's presence, there are pleasures forevermore. There is no joy except in God. If you know God's presence right now, you know blessing in your life. To feel God's presence right now is just, it's sheer joy. But there is coming yet a future aspect of the presence of God where we will be in ecstasy, where it will be a fullness of joy to be in God's presence like we've never experienced it. In thy presence there are pleasures forevermore. So, God is transcendent. That is, he is far above us. We can never really figure him out. But also, God is imminent. He's very near us. He makes himself known to us. I believe, and I hope you agree with me, that knowing God is the greatest goal in human life. And it's really the basis of what human life is all about. It's what makes hum human life meaningful and fulfilling. If you are depressed, if you are, you know, I don't think there's anyone here suicidal. I, I might be wrong. But if you're feeling that, you know what? It's because you haven't pursued the very basis of what makes life meaningful and fulfilling. And that's knowing him. Someone said this, I'm quoting, what comes into your minds when you think about God is the most important thing about you? Because without a doubt, the mightiest thought the mind can think are on thoughts of God. That our idea of God matches who the Bible says he is, is of immense importance. One step down for any Christian is a lowering opinion of God. God's not like anything or anybody. So as it says in the book of Job, acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Get to know him. Get to know him personally. Get to know him intimately. Not just so you can be joyful. Not just so you can have hope. Not just so that... Uh, uh, you can have life to the fullest, not just so you can feel secure and confident, but that so you can know him and make him known to others. That's the deal. We don't get to know God just so that we can be fat and happy spiritually. We get to know God so that we can thin out by sharing him with anyone and everyone around us. In fact, if you know him and he fills your heart, you, he, you can't contain him in that heart of yours. Your heart's too small. It's got to be. He's got to be spread around. And that's what it's about.